And here we are. We are live at last, if you've been waiting. Uh, my name is Jay Frost, and if you haven't been here before, welcome to the Philanthropy Mastermind series. This is one of our webcasts, which is the code word for an actual human conversation with a leader in the sector. And I'm going to be telling you all about that as well as introducing her to you in just a moment. But before we do that, I want to tell you how you can participate today. So uh, as usual, um, we have chat at the bottom of the screen. I'm going to encourage you to go and take a look at that right now, to open that thing up and to say hello so that our guest today knows that you're here and knows maybe where you're from and uh, what organization you're with, if you wish to list that. And then feel free to use the chat throughout, if you will, because that'll be a perfect place to have a conversation amongst yourselves, maybe let some threads emerge. So chat is a perfect place for that. So once again, please open up the chat right now if you're listening to my voice out there and uh, say hello. We'd really, really appreciate you doing that. Um, we also have Q&A. So the Q&A is perfect for the questions that you want to make sure that we get to and we do not forget. Sometimes the chat emerges and becomes this big sea of information and then we lose your question. So if there's something you really want us to focus on, do put it in Q&A and I can see somebody's already opened that up. So uh, once again, please do say hello and then uh, we'll get underway right now. So today's guest, as you can see right there, is Trista Harris, author of Future Good. Hello, Trista. Rookie mistake. Hey, <laughs> Uh, great to have everybody here today. Jay, I just saw a note that people are um, locked out of the, the chat. Um, oh, my. That it's, that it's disabled. So maybe they could put those answers in the Q&A part. Yeah, please. Thank you. That's the first time that's happened. So new day, new problem. But I'm glad somebody alerted us to it. Thank you. So yes, Q&A, move everything over there. We already have a couple questions or a couple comments. Please let us know you're here. Q&A should be open to you. Um, I do want to give a quick introduction to you, Trista, if I may, before we begin the conversation today. Um, if you're not familiar with Trista, um, as you can see, once again, behind her, she's the author, among other things, of Future Good. So I hope you'll put that on your shelf. Um, Trista has been featured on CNN. All of her work has been covered by the Chronicle Philanthropy, um, New York Times, Minneapolis St. Business Journal, many other publications and, and social sector blogs around the country, around the world. She's an international speaker. We were just talking about her engagements in other places, including Sweden a moment ago, um, on the tools of futurism and how to use those to solve society's biggest challenges, which is, of course, one of the issues we'll be talking about today. She is, of course, president of Future Good, a consultancy focused on helping visionary leaders build a better future we're going to dig into that in just a second. And prior to launching Future Good, Trista was president of the Minnesota Council on Foundations. So you're welcome, I think, if she permits, to ask questions that are specifically about that. I'm sure you want to know about that world, too. Um, that is, of course, a vibrant community of grant makers who award more than a billion dollars annually. You heard that right. That's with a B. She was also executive director of the Headwaters Foundation for Justice. Um, and uh, I could go on and on, but I don't want to do that. I don't want to take time from you, Trista. So with that, maybe we can just jump in. Again, thanks for hanging out today. Oh my goodness, thanks so much for having me, Jay. I'm happy to be here and great to be here with your audience. Well, we're happy to have you here. And once again, audience out there, we can't hear you, we can't see you. So the only way we'll know you're here is by talking to us. So please do keep that Q&A active. Um, of course, the subject today is really about um, being a future leader now. How do you, how do you get there? What are the things we need to think about? And when we were talking about this in advance of the presentation, there are a number of things we addressed, but I do want to just highlight the description we had for this. So in case you missed it, it might help as an introduction. And that's that when we are faced with what we've just been living through and are continuing to live through a pandemic in the middle of a racial uprising, um, and uh, which sometimes gets lost in the news thread, but very much uh, that social justice imperative is with us today. Um, those shifts, uh, of course, face a, a, cause us to face uh, long-held policies, social norms, and philanthropic practices that many people think of as immovable. Uh, so the question is, how do we take that same spirit of change we've been living through and hopefully experiencing and, and engaging with into the future so that we can assure that the community needs that we've been finding and discovering um, are addressed, not left behind? So um, maybe to start there, are, are there some um some things that we should be thinking about when we just think about the term even future focused maybe we can start with just a definition can you talk mm -hmm. about what that means to you 
Yeah, I think in the social sector, it's very easy to get just overwhelmed with what is right in front of your face. Very important community needs that all of you are working on. And it can feel like the future is luxurious. So who has time to think about 10, 20 years in the future? I'm trying to figure out this week and make it through. Um, but the, the challenge with only being focused on the present is that um, you react to what's coming towards you as opposed to creating the future that you want to see. And I, I know most of you have, have picked careers in this sector because you want to make something better. And what I think is really important is for us to spend time envisioning the future as we want it to be and then figure out working backwards what are the steps that we have to take to get there. So... <laughs> How in the world do you coach people to think through those steps? I mean, oftentimes we're so, like you say, we're so focused on the present, the present emergency that, um, you know, we're the slave of, of uh, the, the urgent instead of uh, the, mo the more important issues. Well, two different ways. One of the things that I encourage people to do is to set aside two hours every week to think about the future. And Friday afternoons are usually a good time. It's a little bit quieter. And during that time, if you set a Google alert, let's say you're interested in education, set a Google alert for the future of education or the future of transportation or the future of cities or the future of whatever the issue is that you're concerned about and have a folder where all those Google alerts go to. And then in that two hour time, read what's there, see what people are talking about when it comes to the future. If there is a really innovative organization that you're super impressed with, but never have any time to pay attention to, subscribe to their newsletter, stick it in that same folder. And then during that time, as you're reading those articles, keep a notebook, an old fashioned physical notebook, or I like to use Evernote notebooks because I'm keeping track of the future of a million different things for our clients. And if you find something interesting, connected in that Evernote notebook. So, and I, I just read an article about um, land scrapers. So there's skyscrapers that go up, there's land scrapers that go side to side, often in rural communities. We're doing some research about the future of rural. And uh, I have been paying attention to this trend and I just saw a newspaper article about a gigantic warehouse that's being built in Minnesota in a rural community that's the largest that's ever been built. It's gonna serve Amazon and a bunch of other organizations together in the same space. So I, click, I clipped that article and then I wrote a little note about what I thought it meant for my organization, for my clients' organizations. And the, the way that you get a better handle on the future is just making time for it and paying attention to it. And those little notes are giving you clues about what it might mean for your organization moving forward. And then your antennas are up a little bit, and then you start to notice things that are happening that are aligned with those futures that you're starting to hear about. So futurism is really a practice. You are practicing that skill, and the more that you practice it, the, the more able you are to understand what's coming next. Uh, one of the things about thinking forward like that is that uh, a lot of the things that end up in that Google folder might be pretty negative predictions mm -hmm. or at least cast that way by whomever is writing about them. Sure. And how do we um, how do we make sure that we don't become enveloped by the fear and so then we shut down? For sure. I think there's something about using future of and whatever the word is that it usually skews more positive. So it's people that have taken the time and energy to envision what's possible. I think you also need to know about negative possibilities. We do a lot of research about climate and those sorts of things. It's important to know what's possible so that you more actively work towards that alternative future. Um, and for me, I have a really optimistic view of the future because that's the only way that it gets better. So if, if I was hiding under my desk all the time, <laughs> worried about the pandemic and climate change and all of the things that are happening in the world, that's not a way to create transformative change. And so create that positive vision of the future that you're working towards. And it actually makes the sort of dumpster fire of the present a little bit more manageable because you have a view of what you're actually working towards and that it'll be better then. Um, it's so interesting that, that uh, you, you know, that you talked about how an optimism is, is essential, the essential component. So, um, but we live in a world where a lot of people focus on the negative. Yeah. Um, and I know that one part of this is to set up 
your own priority system. That's what you're talking about. But then when we bring those those uh, priorities or discoveries to others that we're going to need to partner with, um, the reality is even if they're thinking forward, they might be thinking, you know, downhill. So how do we address that in conversation? Yeah. You know, introduce ideas without getting, you know, going to the dark places. There, there's a, a chapter in the Future Good book that's called Stop Loving the Problem. And I think that's the most important thing that we have to do in the sector. And I have been in a million meetings like all of you where it's like the racial disparities are this big and this many kids are not getting what they need in their community and this many people are homeless. And the problem with sitting in that space of constantly describing how terrible things are is it feels like you're doing something because you're having a convening or a meeting, you've done a bunch of research, you're, you're sort of talking about what's happening, but you're not actually doing anything to make it better. And so by the stop loving the problem frame is about bringing a solutions mindset to those spaces. So when you are in those meetings, you go, great, that's amazing data. What are we gonna do about it? What is the alternative? What do we want it to look like? What would this problem look like if it's fully fixed? A big piece of future goods work is working with nonprofits and foundations and helping them envision 20 to 50 years in the future. If they have fully met their mission, what does it look like if they've solved the problem that they're, they're working on? What does it look like out in the communities that they care about? And what does it look like inside of their organization? So what sort of organization would they have to be for that to be a true statement? And I think when you sit in that space of envisioning 20 to 50 years in the future, the trick of it is that it doesn't actually take 20 to 50 years to make that future possible. It can take three to five years. Uh, the challenge is that you need alignment and you need people on the same page about what that successful future looks like. And if you give them a long enough runway to envision, then it's about legacy and it's about what's being left behind. It isn't about current work on your desk and do we have the capacity? And I don't think we have the right staff people to make that happen. You instead get to a place where you can dream and imagine something different. And when people get really excited about that future vision in the present, they start realigning their work to match with that vision. And they can really clearly see, here's the things that I'm doing that aren't gonna lead us to that future. One of my favorite examples, we had a, a client that is a youth academic after school program, and we did this 20 year visioning with them. And what they realized is they didn't want kids to have to do academic programs after school 20 years in the future. They'd love for them to ride their bikes and hang out with their friends after school. Could they get everything that they need during the school day? And their regular goal of, can we serve 5% more kids every year? That's never gonna get them to the future that they've envisioned. Now that doesn't mean that you stop doing the academic program because it's obviously needed, but what they decided to do is to use some of their organizational time and resources to work on public policy change, to make sure that schools are funded fully, and to work on teacher training to make sure that teachers have access to cutting edge tools. And so by doing that, in addition to the, the after school program that they've already been doing successfully, that's what's going to lead them to that ideal future. Uh, there's there's so much in just that to unpack. Um, but I'd like to go back to the foundation piece for a minute, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, and uh, by the way, we had a hello from the Minneapolis Foundation. So that was nice to hey, see you. Minneapolis Foundation. <laughs> um, thank you, Joe. Uh, so one of, the, um, one of the issues that foundations have encountered, at least uh, publicly, uh, you know, the kind of the social media interaction they've had um, has been that they have taken perhaps a long view in their in their mind to addressing issues. Yeah. But then uh, the criticism has sometimes been that, that that means that they're taking this almost ivory tower position, yeah. that they see a future that we don't, that they're uh, taking too long to pay out to address the problems we have today. And, and even if there seems to be some kind of potential alignment, feels like there's a disconnect because maybe because they're not really talking or partnering with one another. But how how do we address that kind of problem when you have an individual who sees in their Google folder, here's a bunch of stuff I'm working on. And so I want to take action personally. That's one thing when it's institutionally and it's a community asset. It might be another. Yeah, for sure. I've, I've worked both on the nonprofit side and the philanthropic side ever since I graduated from school. Um, and one of the challenges that you see in the philanthropic side is that that idea of perpetuity. 
So if a foundation is built to last forever, there are lots of conversations about how's the stock market going and will we really live into perpetuity and all of those things. I think often those conversations go too far. And what the government has said is foundations must spend 5% of their assets. That is their responsibility. That is a minimum. It's not a maximum. So what, what I have seen since 2020 has been the most transformative change that I've seen in the philanthropic sector since I've been connected to the field. And often you hear from foundations that doesn't fit within our process, that time frame doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I saw foundations within six weeks move to a place where they were moving huge amounts of money to pandemic response. And later in 2020, I've seen a number of foundations that completely adjusted their grant making to make sure that racial equity was in the forefront. And if the pandemic had lasted six months, nine months, I think that foundations would have gone back to their regular practices, but because the pandemic continues and continues, it has lived across multiple grant cycles. And now this sort of responsive and thoughtful philanthropy is the way that many foundations are just doing it because it has happened multiple times, which makes me unbelievably hopeful for the field. When I talk to foundations, they are looking for transformative change. So just like folks on the nonprofit side, they have dedicated their careers to trying to create transformative change. And there was a, a report that came out when I was the president of the Minnesota Council on Foundations that said that our Minnesota foundations had put billions of dollars into education over the previous 10 years and the results for kids were actually worse at the end of 10 years. So there, there is nothing more frustrating than feeling like you have been investing resources and in trying to create change and the pace of change is getting worse faster than you're able to invest in those. And so when you come to a foundation and say, here's our vision of the future, here's what we're working towards and what we're trying to create. Yes, there are a lot of problems in this moment, but here's how we think we're gonna to get to a different future. That's where the easy yes is because they are just as desperate for big solutions as folks are on the nonprofit side. The two examples you gave are, are really interesting uh, to, dig into a little bit the pandemic response um yeah. it does seem like there was almost almost a universal uh, awareness that they, that there needed to be uh, a shift in yeah. grant making priorities mm -hmm. um just as there was in some of the government um not all of it but many of the government uh, responses yeah. uh, and then um with res the response to uh, all all the things that happened after especially after George Floyd's murder mm -hmm. and we can talk about that yeah. more in, in a moment because I know that you've been close to that physically and and know that neighborhood as well yeah. um but uh but I'm wondering about something you, you observed you said that uh you know a, a commitment to racial equity and um I wonder if the reason that the foundations took on that challenge was because of the protests in the streets which is urgent so it's less yeah. sort of like the hospitals were filling. So the foundations and the government had to do something for a pandemic response. The reason I'm, I'm making that, trying to figure that out, uh, unpack that is because will that be sustained? It's one thing to say, okay, we've seen a pandemic, there's gonna be another pandemic. Mm -hmm. So therefore we have transformed, we will address these things more concretely and rapidly. It might be another to say, we're actually committed to uh, racial equity um, because if the, transformative moment for them was people marching in the streets, but nobody's yeah. marching the streets today. Will mm -hmm. they continue to be yeah. committed? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So um, in my time in working in philanthropy, there were a million terrible things that happened. And there was always, we're going to write a statement and this is so terrible and this does not align with our values as a community You know, all, all those good things. Uh, it seemed like there was a period of time when I was running the Minnesota Council on Foundations where every week it was like, oh, we've got a statement that we have to write about something. And at some point, the question is, what are you doing besides the statements? And I think the, the difference with the murder of George Floyd is that there was sometimes multiple uh, changes in society intersect at the same time. And so the intersection of the pandemic and a very visible police murder at the same time meant that people had the time and space to pay attention to what's happening. 
Philando Castile was also murdered in Minnesota in a very, very visible way. And there was a lot of attention, but it was different than sort of what happened when George Floyd was murdered because of the amount of sort of eyeballs and attention that was that was paid to that. They they often give the example of uh, the, the, the transformations that happened around civil rights in the 1960s had to do with tele television crews that sort of suddenly putting it on your 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 television in your living room. It has a, a different sort of meaning. Mm -hmm. um, and so during that time where everybody's paying a lot of attention, there are lots of places that you can point fingers. So the police department and system is a really great place to point your finger. Government response is another place to point a finger. But then you also start to think about systemic racism and inequality and all of these other things that exist in society that have amplified into this moment. And you start to wonder about the many institutions in our society that can amplify those disparities and the nonprofit and philanthropic sectors were two of those places that normally everybody thinks we're great, we're doing good stuff, you're trying to help the community, what could be wrong with that? Uh, suddenly it was like, wait a second, what are you guys doing over there? What Are you equitable institutions? I, I would think you are, but now I'm hearing some rumblings from you know staff members on anonymous Facebook groups that maybe staff of color aren't getting promoted. Maybe I'm looking at who's on your board of directors or where you're spending dollars and realizing that it doesn't really align with the values that you say that you have. And I, I have a great mentor that said that the easiest way to shut down a foundation is to have two protesters stand outside with signs that say, we don't like what you're doing. <laughs> it just the whole oh. thing would collapse. <laughs> that's, um, not, that's not advice for everybody here, <laughs> by the way. Yes, <laughs> um, but it, it, foundations don't get negative attention usually because they are they are giving dollars and that's a sure. good thing. Yeah. And so if there is a moment where people are going, wait a second, what are you doing? And then the foundations look internally and go, wait a second, what are we doing? What I saw happen after that that was very different than all of the previous. Let's send a statement out. It was an internal look, and in that internal look. Um, there's a, a four roles framework that we use with our clients that helps them think about their role as a, a program provider or a grant maker, an economic entity that's spending and investing dollars, a community citizen that has a voice that you can use to, to lift up diversity, equity, and inclusion, and you're an employer. What is your racial equity frame across all, all four of those roles? Because it'd be really easy to just look at that grant maker role and say, you know, we weren't doing a good job giving grants to communities of color we're gonna make sure we start to do that. But if your insides don't match your outsides, that's where challenges happen. And so we saw a number of, of clients and other foundations say, we need to look at this internal place and do we have a diverse vendor policy? Are we spending dollars in a way that lift up our, our local diverse communities? Um, are we able to retain staff of color? Are we hiring staff of color and are we able to retain them? Why or why, why not? Are they getting promoted in our organization? Are we keeping track of that? Uh, and then when do we decide to stand up for injustice in our community? It does it, how visible does it have to be for us to say something? Um, and what are our policies and procedures around that? So that internal look is permanent. I mean, I, I can't tell you the number of organizations that have changed their hiring policies and practices. They used to say, you need to have a master's degree. Do you really even need a college degree to do this job? It says it's connecting. It's very strange. I can hear you. Zoom yeah. gremlins. That's the, that's the name of the game for these last couple of years. <laughs> and, and I think everybody got kicked out. So they're the coming back. The brave, the brave are coming back. So thank you for for you folks that did that, um, and it, and you got cut off right in the middle of describing that. So yeah. I don't, I don't so know. I think that um, we have moved to a place where foundations are deeply looking internally, mm -hmm. and seeing what their role is in that transformative change, and then they're baking it in. So it isn't a sort of here's an extra thing that we do on the side. It is a frame that is over all of their policies and procedures. And that's where the long-term permanent change is. It's not just gonna be about good intentions of who's sitting in those seats. Right. The institution is actually changing to become more equitable. I wanna ask you about a couple of things there. Uh, one is uh, very much about definition, but the other is about that word about permanence. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I'll start with that because you were just talking about these changes are effect effectively permanent. Um, 
if we had had a discussion about, for example, diversity 30 years ago, because I'm old, so I remember how these things were defined then, yeah, yeah. it would have been, I think, pretty different from the discussion which people my son's age are having today. In other words, I, th I, I, I see that as evolutionary, that, we, uh, that um, the experience of young people in America today mm -hmm. is fundamentally different, for, not for all, but for many, more diverse environments, more diverse classrooms, mm -hmm. diverse thought. Anyway, um, so if, if the, a, a process and a policy were instituted in 1960, 1980, 2000, which was uh, of that time the understanding of what constituted diversity, equity, and inclusion, although yep. I'm not sure we were using the term in quite that way back then, um, that still wouldn't be very, an optimal policy for today. So while the policy is permanent, and mm -hmm. that seems like a good thing, is it also evolutionary? Does it keep evolving with us? I think the interesting piece with many organizations is they've started to build in a process um, with, with some of our clients, we do a, a rolling three-year plan to help the organization become more equitable. And at the end of each year, you're adding another year to the plan. So the intention is to sort of look at what's the progress that we've been able to make, what was really hard that we thought was going to be easy, and what did we knock out of the park because everybody was completely on board, and let's reconfigure what those future year goals are. And what makes me hopeful about that sort of process is that it is that consistent um, improvement that, that you were talking about. How do you make sure you don't get stuck with an idea of what equity looks like in this moment that may be very different than what the future looks like? Wow, kind of Kaizen for DEI, which is exactly. a pretty great concept, actually. <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> something good from business that can be applied yes. to social good. Yes. Um, and then, then the other thing is about the word equity. So yes. um, I, I, I'm pretty sure I know what you mean, but I think it's healthful, healthy and helpful to define these things. So, so would you describe what you mean by equity and equitable? Yeah, I think I, I really love um, John Powell's model that many of you have seen with the baseball field and the fence and the, right. the, the, the little lifts that are underneath each of the kids. I think um, especially within our organizations, we have to build our, our programs and our systems for the hardest to reach. And what happens then is that you actually make it work better for everybody. So uh, Angela Glover Blackwell has this great example of dips and sidewalks for wheelchairs. And there was a, a huge organizing process that happened that, that made that true. And actually it's really uh, tied to the pandemic. So after the war, a lot of soldiers were disabled and needed to be able to get around. And there's a sort of frustration of running into to sidewalks and they were able to push this transformative change forward. Um, and what happens is business owners are like, no, we don't have anybody with wheelchairs in our community. You can't make us. We're going to shut down with all this construction. How dare you? Progress moves forward. And now if you are in a wheelchair, you can move yourself around and the world is much more accessible and it was necessary for you to be able to get where you needed to go. But if I'm pushing a stroller or pulling a suitcase, suddenly the world is much more accessible to me as well. Um, the, the way that it ties to the pandemic is COVID is a mass disabling event. And I think we have not even started to scratch the surface of what that means for us as a society. Um, but because we are at a place where suddenly many, many, many more people are disabled, we're gonna start to have conversations about what, what is our policies within our organizations and within the government for folks that are disabled? If you are only able to work, but you can only work from home because suddenly you're out of breath if you're walking up a flight of steps because COVID's damaged your lungs, um, how do we need to adjust our organizations for that to work? And those adjustments are actually gonna make the, the workplace and society better for everybody. Um, it's so interesting that you're um, some of the examples you're using are ones where, uh, especially with respect to um, access, uh, like the ADA access and the, and the yeah. ramps and, and so forth, that um, that brought together people who weren't necessarily aligned politically. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the objections to some of those changes might have been, it, it'll never happen. I mean, you hear that about any kind of change is it, it's not going to happen. We don't have enough friends on our side. But I wonder what really caused the change. And it's the reason I'm framing this is that you've talked early on in this conversation about how an individual 
can think forward, right? That future uh, planning. And then about how an institution like a foundation uh, can do so. But then there's also this collective movement that occurs. And that seems a little different. And sometimes it can bring together people who, especially these days, seem like they're at each other's throats. Do you have thoughts on how to get kind of the collective thinking forward in the same way, future planning? I, I think people have to know what they can win in a new future. And uh, there, there's a lot of people that complain about it, but I think the Green New Deal, um, there are some, uh, I saw a great cartoon video that was sort of like what your day would be like in a world after the Green New Deal. And that's a future that a lot of folks can get behind. And so how do you help people understand what's possible uh, in the news and in media? We really have this sort of Hunger Games future that people are sure that it's coming towards them and they are really just trying to enjoy this moment and get whatever they can out of the system before the whole thing collapses. Mm -hmm. But I think instead we can envision, you know, the Star Trek future. What is it that we want, want it to look like in the future? And how do we work towards that as, as a, instead of assuming that it's going to be terrible? Right. Although a Star Trek future means no money. So that'll be interesting. In the <laughs> I was going to say, I've seen some <laughs> negative things in the Star Trek future too, but I think that's, it's one of the challenges is like, there are not money. a lot of great examples of what a, a positive, abundant future looks like. And I think it's up to us to start to, to create those stories and to create those pictures so that people can hold on to them. Uh, just a, a personal question. How did you become so interested in this? I mean, when did this start for you? Yeah. So I, I have always, um, I, I've known that I wanted to work in the nonprofit sector when I was eight. Uh, my mom volunteered in a community center and uh, I got to spend a lot of time there and really loved a sort of place where good things happen and knew that I wanted to, to work someplace like that. Um, and then started working in nonprofits in, in high school and then after graduate school and all those sort of things. But when I was running the Headwaters Foundation, I was probably a couple months into the job I was 29 years old running a foundation. Wow. We were responsible for fundraising. And so our, our organizations were working on economic justice and racial justice and environmental justice issues and really important things. And it was my responsibility to make sure that we had those resources. Mm -hmm. And so I had a little post-it note on my computer that said, learn how endowments work <laughs> because we had an endowment. I had no idea how it worked. I was responsible for it. And it was sort of like, oh, that's something I should learn. Um, a couple months into the job in 2008, the stock market collapsed and our endowment lost between 30 to 50% of its value. And because we were trying to be a good grant maker that made multiple year grants and did general operating support and all of those sort of things, suddenly we did not have new money to give to organizations that in that moment desperately needed our support. And so it is not a great place to be. And uh, my son was then a, a little toddler and based in Minneapolis. And there is a bookstore here that uh, is called Wild Rumpus Books and it's got wild animals running around. So there's chickens and bunnies and cats and parrots and wow. it's wild. So it's like a toddler paradise. So we got there, he did not want to leave. And they had a little chair in the corner, kind of like school conferences where you're sitting in the teeny chair and a, a pile of books that all other parents had left that had been stuck there. So one of the books was called Flash Forward, and it is about how to use futurism to gain a business advantage during times of crisis. And so I read it front to back while we were there and realized that, hey, we're in a time of crisis. Uh, maybe some of these tools would be useful and started to bring them to our grantees. And what happened in the year and a half after that is our grantees had 10 legislative wins, including alternative teacher certification to diversify our teaching force, uh, homeowner's bill of rights to deal with the mortgage foreclosure crisis, uh, and marriage equity in the state of Minnesota. And it was the most legislative wins that our grantees had had in our entire history. And I credit that to us helping them develop a shared vision of what was possible. What, were the, what was the future that they were working towards? Um, and how do they get aligned across multiple organizations to be able to make those futures possible? Um, the people who come to this series are typically fundraisers or yeah. fundraising adjacent. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, they often find themselves in that role by accident, not by design. There's no particular 
you know, coursework yeah. for it. You know all this. I've been um, an accidental fundraiser too. Yes. An accidental fundraiser. <laughs> it doesn't mean we don't love it, but you know, yes. we're we're kind of the asteroids hitting the Earth here. It's an accident. So yeah. um, I guess one of the issues for many of us might be as we think forward and imagine that future um, individually, institutionally, and even in this sense, like a community coming together for the kinds of change you want to see. Um, it also means that we inevitably have the two things that you were just thinking about, wherever we are financially, you know, if it's an economic crisis or a booming stock market, inevitably we have to make a goal. And so fundraisers are thinking about that. And that is something that we need to do. If we don't do that, we don't get anywhere. But maybe you can help us to unravel why thinking with this future focus can help us be successful today, even financially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely financially. So what we have found with many of our visioning clients is at the end, they have an ideal future that they can talk to foundations and individual donors about. And they're able to sort of point to the, the point on the horizon that they're working towards and say, here's where we're trying to go and here's how your dollars are gonna help us get there. As somebody that was a program officer for many years, most of the grant proposals that I received were, here are the terrible conditions in the community, please give us dollars. And I was like, that is really depressing. <laughs> so it, you're, you're sort of spending all this time describing how bad things are and with a hope that your intervention will make a difference, but you're not telling me what that difference might look like. It, it makes gut sense that if we invest in that after school program, good things will happen. But what I'd much rather hear about is that story of kids that don't have to go to an after school program. And here are the steps that we're taking that will actually make that future possible. So I think that future focused organizations are much more likely to receive resources. And I've, I've talked to some of the folks that have helped with the um, uh, McKinsey uh, Scott gifts and those conversations with organizations. And what I consistently hear is those that have a really clear picture of the future that they are trying to create are the easiest investments to make because you know if you put in those extra resources, here's what it's gonna look like if they're successful. Uh, wow, which is probably another good time to say that uh, this does not mean that people shall reach out to you in order to get to Mackenzie Scott. Uh, <laughs> that, that's not the message. Um, although before we go any further, I do want to encourage people to be able to read more about your your work. So um, I, we have some other questions. and I'd love to get any questions that might be out there from those who resumed the program with us. Um, but can you share, Trista, how people can learn more about you, about your book, about your work? Yep, you can. Uh, wearefuturegood.com uh, is our website. We Are Future Good is also on all of the socials. Those are the best places to connect. Um, Future Good does a lot of visioning with organizations. So often you're sort of in that strategic uh, planning lane. It's that same sort of work, but using futurism tools to be able to get there with we made a decision about six months ago that any time we do that strategic visioning work that we're using an equity frame for the work. So it used to be something that we would add on, like if you want to make sure this is an equitable future, here are the two more steps that we do with you. But uh, organizationally, with limited time, we decided that we don't want to work with organizations that aren't working to create an equitable future. And so let's help them uh, use those tools. Um, the other way as folks are thinking about their own futurism uh, sort of development and how to build those skills, we have something called Future Good Studio that is launching this fall. Uh, Target made a commitment to Black businesses in Minnesota uh, back in 2020, and we were one of the businesses that was selected, and they helped us develop a 12-week learning program that teaches folks how to be future-focused. And there's video training that goes along with it, as well as small mastermind groups. And I think the, the challenge that you described a little bit earlier, of like, what if you have this big view of the future and then everybody around you is like, the sky is falling, why, why plan for the future? Um, you need to surround yourself with people that are working to build a better future. And so these small mastermind groups allowed you to develop a network of support around the country of other people that are also working to use futurism within their work. Yeah, in fact, I did want to ask you about that, it, kind of bringing us way down. So, uh, the, you know, the experience that you've had, even including right there locally, and you're, you're bringing us there right now. Yeah. One of the issues that's been discussed in our sector the last couple of years, and I brought this up in a number of programs, has to do with this uh, 
it, it's almost like there are only two ways that we can think about philanthropy. That seems to be the casting. And mm -hmm. one is it's all about the donor and only what the donor wants. Yeah. And the other is it's, uh, it's what the community wants if one exactly knew that all the time. Yeah. And so <laughs> therefore, you know, it's like the, the donor be damned. It's, you know, we have to figure out what the community sentiment is and yeah. instead of, you know, a more integrative kind of approach, mm -hmm. which is, one would hope that we would always be looking towards something which is totally inclusive. But the reason I'm mentioning this is what you just said. If you build a cohort of people like in these mastermind groups where people can come together and vision the future together, come up with that positive thing that they want to see in the world, um, it, it, what are the mechanisms for ensuring that it's also inclusive of all those people, that the yeah. people from the person who works at Target you know, on a part-time basis to the person who is the CEO of Target, wherever, whoever that is. Yeah. Uh, how do we make sure they're all in the same room envisioning yeah. the future? Yeah, that's one of the processes that folks will learn in the program is how to make sure that when you're setting a table as you're creating a vision, that that table is representative. So when we're working with client organizations, we say your board, staff, volunteers, participants, community members, partnering organizations should all be a part of this visioning process because you each have a different sort of lens into both the problems and opportunities. And when you create that sort of table, that's where big transformative change comes from. Yeah. Um, now, speaking of that transformational change and right there in the community, um, can you talk a little bit about what this has been like for you the last couple of years? Because yes. you, you've been kind of in the thick of it, both professionally and, and you know, <laughs> right there in town. Yeah, I'm, I am uh, born and raised in Minneapolis and uh, have done a lot of work here around racial equity and, and justice. Jay and I were talking uh, before this call, um, after Philando Castile was murdered, I joined our governor's council on law enforcement and community relations um, to, to try to develop a new path forward with our community and police. At the end of that process, which I think aged me probably 20 years <laughs> being in that process, we, uh, I brought a future visioning process to that group to help us think about what our, our shared future was that we were trying to come to. And the only place that we could get agreement is that we wanted both community members and police to go home safe every day. That's what we were working towards. And so we agreed to uh, significant increases in budget for uh, police training and for um, diversity, equity, and inclusion training for police officers throughout the state of Minnesota. There was a lot of pushback from rural communities that they didn't need that and why are you making us and what we heard from our native nations that are a part of Minnesota is you definitely do need this. Um, and so felt like there was some incremental change that was created. Uh, and then in 2020, George Floyd was murdered a, a few blocks away from my old home and the police precinct is in the neighborhood that I grew up in and, you know, watched our, our city burn down, I think justifiably. And so I got a call from the, the newspaper, sort of, you spent a lot of time on this process, you must be really frustrated about what's happening in community, you know, what is, what is your statement? And my statement was, I can understand why people are upset and all of the work that we did did not make a lick of difference because if it did, Chauvin wouldn't have murdered George Floyd because he would have either been kicked out as a police officer long before or would have had much better training. And so if the if the system is not working for people, we need something completely different. I was not quoted in the newspaper, um, <laughs> but well, but I but that's I think, interesting. <laughs> um, what I think happened in that moment is there was a, an awareness that the status quo was going to be deadly for communities here and continue to be deadly and, unless something was very different and. You know, you heard a lot of calls for defunding the police coming from Minnesota and other places. I think that that part is very catchy. What was missing is replace the police in these different ways with these types of services. And then here is what the safety replacement is that it doesn't fit as well on a, on a, a billboard. So um, I, I think what we have started to have and continue to work on in the Twin Cities is a vision of what safety looks like. So what do we want our community to look and feel like for all community members? And what are the systems that need to be in place for people to feel like they're safe? 
And that is going to be long, hard, slow work that's going to continue over many, many years. But I think what that spark created was a moment for everybody to say, this is obviously not working. This, is, this, this system is not serving our community in the ways that it needs to, and we need something different. And so let's come up with some solutions about what different looks like. Well, I'm sorry they didn't quote you in the paper because it was probably the most succinct and, you know, uh, answer they had to what was going on. But, um, but I do, I, I am interested in something else you said before we began today, which is about, and it relates to this, incrementalism versus this future focus. Yes. Yeah. And that you said a moment ago that, you know, something which that change will occur over many years. I mean, almost echoes the famous Dr. King statement, right, that the arc yeah. of justice and, more, uh, you know, um, but the uh, the reason why I'm mentioning this is because just because you think it's going to happen over time doesn't mean that you're trying to go slowly. Yeah, no, and it doesn't mean that you're looking for incremental change. So I think it's transformative change that is going to take a long time to get there. Okay. And the challenge with incremental change, especially for the work that all of us are doing in the social sector, is if you're trying to, you know, raise 5% more dollars so you can serve 5% more community members, and the problem is getting 10% worse every year, you are never going to catch up with that pace of change. The, the other thing is that we are in a time of exponential change. So many of you have probably seen an exponential curve when it's tied to computer processing and that sort of thing, where the the speed of the computer doubles at a very predictable rate and the cost uh, goes down over time and it's supposed to go down over time, you know, <laughs> all those sort of things. Right. Um, the, the challenge is that it isn't just about technology. We as humans are now living on an exponential curve, which is why everything feels so miserable because we are not made for this pace of change. And I hear from a lot of folks, I can't wait until the pandemic is over and things get to, to normal. I can't wait till summer when things calm down and it slows down. We're, we're not on a slowdown. We are on a, a pace that gets faster and faster, which is why I think these futurism skills are even more important because if you are just reacting to things as they happen, you're not gonna have enough time to ever get in front of it. If you create a picture of where you wanna be five years from now, you can actually harness that exponential change to get yourself there a lot faster and you can notice things in the present that are aligned with that future that you're working to create. Yeah, I was just imagining if you're driving a car down the highway and you're going faster and faster, you're not looking directly at the pavement in front of your car. If you're going faster, you're looking at ahead. Yep. Um, that's and that's the only way you can make sure that you're not gonna, you know, get totally stressed out or have an accident. Yeah. Um, so when you're when you're thinking about all these things, putting it all together, and especially having you know lived through a community that has felt that front and center, what's the uh, what's the future focus that you have? What's in your folder? What's in that Google folder? <laughs> Are you able to reveal that secret? Yeah, there's lots of good stuff in there. So I am really, really hopeful about the potential of artificial intelligence, intelligence and robotics. There are a lot of people that are worried about what is that going to do for the workforce. What I think that it's going to do is um, jobs and things that are routine and sort of don't use the best of humans thoughtfulness will no longer be done by humans. And the, the best example that I've seen is uh, often there's these uh, beautiful woven rugs that are made by children. And it's because they've got little fingers and they're able to create these complicated patterns. That is not what a child should be doing. And they have trained robots to be able to create the same quality of woven rugs as a child's able to do. That's the sort of technology that I wanna see more and more of. Um, I have family that's in Wyoming that have been coal miners for three generations. And we have lots of conversations about what's coming next. And you know, there's sort of frustration about green energy and where is it gonna go and what's gonna to happen to all these jobs. And I point to my cousin who has transitioned into a clean energy job from working in a coal mine and has a nicer truck and does not have to go underground for eight hours a day and is living a much better life. And so if that is the power of green energy, how are we transforming folks into new roles where they're partnering with technology uh, as opposed to having to do all of this work with their own bodies? So I'm, I'm really hopeful about what's coming next. And I think that 
uh, young people and the entire world are much more connected than we've ever been previously, which means that we deeply care about what's happening in other places and want to make a difference. And harnessing that human concern, I think, is how everything's gotten better in society. It's a beautiful way to kind of wrap up some of this discussion. Thank you so much, Trista, for all of this and for putting up with the technological hurdles that we had today. I really Perfect. do appreciate you. Thanks for having me here today, Jay. I appreciate it. And a thank you to those of you who uh, went through the first and second round of this discussion today. Um, I want to encourage you again to go and take a look at uh, Trista's book um, and her website, which she said you can find her over there uh, at tristaharris.org, but also at, of course, you want to list yeah. a website. We, we are futuregood.com. Yes. So um, do take a look for that, if you will. And uh, also join us if you're interested in these issues for some of the other discussions coming up. Well, we have a number of things in the next couple of weeks that I think you'll find a nice companion to this discussion. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can find all that information over at the home of our sponsor, DonorSearch, at DonorSearch.net. So if you'd like to know more about what they do, which, by the way, includes artificial intelligence for fundraising, um, I'll, let you, I'll let them tell you all about that. Uh, but I also am a believer uh, that, uh, that you can harness um, artificial intelligence for good. And that's what DonorSearch is trying to do. You can learn all about that at DonorSearch.net. And while you're there, you can find everything in the Masterminds program uh, under the Resources tab, both past programs as well as the current ones. And learn about us over on YouTube or um, over on the, uh, your favorite podcasting channels. All of that's right there. So until next time, stay healthy out there, would you? And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you then. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jake. Take care. Thanks.